Welcome to Indisputable, I'm your host, Rashad Richard, good to be with you. We have a lot on the agenda today, breaking down news of the day. My contributor, none other than Ravana. She is host of Reactions on Twitch, should be a fascinating breakdown. Top story of the day, Donald Trump announced he's running for President of the United States again. Well, white supremacists, those rooted in violence, hatred and bigotry were disappointed in his relaunch speech. Here's some of it. People don't want elegance, people want revenge. And this is what was promised to us. This is what was promised to us. Trump promised revenge. This is what people want. They're not looking for elegance. They're not looking to to toe the line, to follow the rules, to follow the rule of law, because that's not what they're doing to us. That's not what they're doing to us. People are looking for Trump to go Mussolini mode. And it's not just the far right who is thinking this. It's every single Trump supporter out there, every single Trump voter out there who is is thinking this. I don't know who wrote the speech, but the speech was dog for the most part. Vincent James, white supremacist, has told the truth. The truth is Trump supporters, they are not violent to their core. They are criminal in nature. They are willing to overthrow rule of law, US Constitution, and every other norm of democratic principle. We have, why? Because they have no identifiable values system. The only thing they give a damn about is power. At the end of the day, they will utilize whatever method necessary in order to obtain power. Another well known white supremacist, Nick Fuentes. This was his real time reaction to Trump saying he's running for president again. Here it is. Uh, that was horrible. That is one of the worst things I've ever seen in my entire life. And I'm reevaluating my support for Trump 2024 after that. That was bad. That was probably worst case scenario. Worse than I was anticipating. I wasn't sure because the last couple rallies were good. Uh, but this was awful. It's hard to imagine how it could have been worse from beginning to end and style and substance, the delivery, the content, the entire thing was an abject, absolute failure and a disaster and a total disappointment. White supremacists are in agreement because Donald Trump did not call for violence against other groups because Donald Trump did not say aggressively violent things in his speech announcing his opportunity to run again, they are disappointed. They wanted something more like this. We will never give up, we will never concede. It doesn't happen, you don't concede when there's theft involved. Our country has had enough, we will not take it anymore. And that's what this is all about. And to use a favorite term that all of you people really came up with, we will stop the steal. We have come to demand that Congress do the right thing and only count the electors who have been lawfully slated, lawfully slated. That's the Donald Trump they want. That is the Donald Trump that was and truthfully, it is the Donald Trump still here. Now, remember, here's how his speech went when he announced running again. Always have known that this was not the end. It was only the beginning of our fight to rescue the American dream. And it's a word you don't use, two words. I don't want to be Joe, it's two words, American dream. <laughs> that was not good what he did. There are a lot of bad things like going to Idaho and saying, welcome to the state of Florida, I really love it. <laughs> In order to make America great and glorious again, I am tonight announcing my candidacy for President of the United States. Okay, Donald Trump, he lied during his speech, he always lies. He said things that were contrary to facts, yes. Did he incite violence in that speech? No. Who's disappointed, white supremacists? Now, here's the issue for everyone. 
Donald Trump is not a transformational leader, he's transactional. So you have to be concerned about Donald Trump becoming a reflection once again of the worst in America. Will he lead beyond those who say, you don't have the juice anymore, Donald? Or will he become a mirror reflection of their own ideology as he was when he was president for four years? Here's another dynamic that we must consider. There's an appetite, a significant appetite in America from white bigots in particular to have a champion, a leader in the style of Donald Trump. Now, will the party, I'm talking about Republicans, reject that kind of leadership ideology or will they embrace it through people like, I don't know, Governor Ron DeSatan of Florida <laughs> or others? You see, this is a dangerous dynamic no matter how it shapes out because just being 100, Donald Trump is likely to change his tone back to a tone that fits those who identify as white supremacist. All right, my dear sister, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, at first I agree, like Trump was fairly low energy, sleepy Donald Trump, I heard people are calling him no um, in that speech, but it absolutely will shift, especially once we get closer and closer, because we're way far out now, years out. But when we get to the primaries, I think we'll start to see a lot more of like the 2015, 2016 candidate, Donald Trump, that was you know always on the attack, was able to, without saying anything of substance or in truth, destroy the other candidates for the Republican primary. And I do think we will see a turn towards that. As we see more people announcing their candidacy um, and as we near the, the primaries. But I do think that, um, that what the white supremacists are saying is echoed throughout the larger Republican Party because they were hoping so dearly to be able to rub in the faces of Democrats uh, a massive loss in the midterms and it didn't come to pass. There was no red tsunami, uh, there wasn't even a red wave. They didn't get that feeling of being able to just, you know, uh, destroy their enemies, so to speak, because what they wanted to do, it didn't happen. So now they were hoping when Donald Trump was announcing his candidacy that he would come at it hard, aggressive, use the same sort of white nationalist rhetoric that they love to hear, attack the Democrats, attack the Republicans who they don't think are far right enough. And then that didn't come to pass. You know, I could see them being more willing to admit that they were disappointed. They've taken a couple L's lately. I hope they take some more in the future. Yeah. And I also believe, this is just a theory, but I believe part of the reason why he was more subdued in that speech is because of the runoff with Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock. Now he was advised not to announce until that election was settled. He was advised not to announce until after the midterm. And then we had this major runoff, he was told, hey, don't do it. So I think what he did as a compromise possibly was water down the speech, Wait until after this election in Georgia, the senatorial runoff. And then I think you're gonna get the real Donald Trump as he plans the campaign, we shall see. $360 plus million dollars awarded to an employee. Why? Because FedEx discriminated according to the lawsuit. Let's put up the picture of Jennifer. This is a hell of a story. Jennifer had no idea this kind of money was gonna come her way. A Texas jury has returned a verdict of more than 360 million to a former FedEx employee who said the company engaged in retaliation because she complained about racism. Jennifer Harris is her name, alleged in her lawsuit that she was hired by FedEx as an entry level inside sales rep. This was back in 2007. She rose through the ranks, receiving six promotions and eventually rising to the rank of district sales manager. Her sales team was one of the best in FedEx. Things changed, however, March 2019. She said when a white supervisor posed a question, asked her to accept a demotion, she said, okay, well, when Harris balked at the request, negative treatment, of her escalated and her supervisor took away commissions that she earned according to the allegation. A white HR advisor allegedly said, and I quote, just go on with your job, it'll blow over. But she complained to HR of alleged discrimination. Harris added, added FedEx responded by telling her that her job performance was subpar. 
and then terminating her employment in January of 2020 after a sham investigation. Harris decided not to let her firing be the end and filed a racial discrimination and retaliation lawsuit against FedEx. This took place Monday, May 20th, 2021. The lawsuit alleges FedEx failed to follow its own policies prohibiting discrimination and prohibiting retaliation. The jury agreed, a Texas jury believes Harris and her claims of discrimination and retaliation and decided to send a strong message by ordering FedEx to pay Harris over 360 million in damages. The quote is from the attorney. I felt very good about our chances of winning the case. I did not expect the amount, Attorney Brian Sanford said of the jury verdict. So let me tell you why this is really important. Because sometimes statutory law will not remedy workplace issues like discrimination. We can have all the laws in the world. We can have great policies. FedEx actually does have good policies on paper. But when culture is adversarial to the policy, culture wins every day. And in order to enforce a policy, sometimes you have to take that company to court. It is a great enforcement tool. She stood up, did what was right, and now because she stood up to the racism of these FedEx workers, the policy and the culture are now much more aligned than they were before. Sometimes it takes leadership like this in order to create avenues for other people. What she has done has not only benefited her, but it has benefited a generation of employees and managers she would never meet. That's how this works. All right, dear sister, what are your thoughts here? Yes, I do discrimination cases in my line of work. I do disability discrimination cases, um, but generally the same sort of uh, issues there that go into it. But when it comes to becoming a plaintiff in a case of uh, workplace discrimination particularly, I think that people might have a misconception as to um, the difficulties that people have to overcome to be involved in that sort of lawsuit, because it's not even first you have to face the discrimination in the workplace. But now when you've put your name on a lawsuit, when you become a plaintiff, it's harder to find another job. You're gonna get harassed by that company and be bogged down in litigation for years. And you might not see a payoff in the end. And I'm so thankful that this this worker was brave enough to come forward to engage in this lawsuit. And I'm glad that she reaped the rewards of that and that there'll be you know, better policies, better working conditions for people to come afterwards. Cuz it is really hard to step up and, and you know, put yourself in that position in the first place. There it is, well said. There's a cop who shot a student during a school drill by accident. Let's put up his picture. Let me give you background to this insanity. An investigation is now underway in Vermilion County, Indiana. Deputy accidentally fired a gun, shot a high schooler. Indiana State Police have identified the deputy as Tim Despinet, a 19 year veteran with the county sheriff's office. Okay, you see him, right? Right, he has now been placed on administrative leave, which is a standard procedure after a shooting. In a news release Thursday, Indiana State Police said the shooting happened around 9.30 AM at the county high school in Clinton. The deputy was speaking to a class about law enforcement and law enforcement scenarios. During the instruction, the deputy accidentally discharged his service weapon and hit a student in the classroom. The student was given medical assistance and taken to a hospital with what ISP said are injuries not considered life threatening. And according to the report, it was likely a graze. Now, obviously, the student could be dead or seriously injured, or other students could have been injured as well. How did this happen? Who does a training with a gun not on safety? You're an officer, been an officer for many years. I guarantee this, if let's say a regular citizen did something like that and it was on accident, they will go to jail. The reason is because we would determine the action to be so grossly negligent that even though you did not have mans rea, you did not want to commit a crime. Your gross negligence is enough for us to charge you because that's foreseeable. 
You have a loaded gun, not on safety, around children, and you're horsing around. Just because you are the police should not create an immunity for from you shooting children. All right, there's more. Uh, the high school was on lockdown due to the abundance of emergency personnel in the building. Dave Chapman, let's put him up. So Dave is the superintendent of the uh, school system. Uh, and the high school senior that was grazed by the bullet, the male student described his pain as a sting. Chapman told WTWO TV the shooting occurred in a popular vocational law enforcement class that's taught by deputy sheriffs from the county sheriff's office. Uh, the county sheriff Mike Phelps requested that the state handle the investigation. State Police Sergeant Matt Ames said they will be interviewing the deputy and students who were in the classroom at the time of the shooting. Once that investigation is complete, the findings will be turned over to the county prosecutor's office for review. Um, so let me say this, uh, obviously this is likely not an intentional shooting, okay? Now I say that, now damn it, I've been proven wrong before. But I'm going to give this guy the benefit of the doubt. He did it on accident. Okay, there, there still should be a penalty. Uh, and as I said before, if a civilian did something like this, there would be an immediate criminal penalty because you decided not to engage in a proper protocol, safety protocol around children and the danger you created was actually foreseeable. Uh, but I'm glad I'm able to talk to a real attorney uh, who can give some insight into this. This to me looks very negligent to have this level of, I don't know, an abandonment of safety protocols in front of children. What are your thoughts? I mean, it's absolutely negligent. And the fact that the police department is not immediately firing him, I'm not yeah. surprised because they, you know, they don't want to come out and immediately say, because they could be liable too, because he's an officer of their department and say, you know, we know that what he did was wrong. You know, we, we want to distance ourselves from him. That being said, yeah, I mean, this was a negligent act. You're, first of all, you're supposed to be training kids. Um, you know how to react in an active shooter situation. You're supposed to be training kids, you know, about gun safety, and you're in the school, and now you shot a child. So now, so now, not only do these children have the fear of uh, an active shooter coming into their school, they have the fear of even engaging in the training to prevent that, or you know, to protect themselves in the event that that happens. Because now you've given them this trauma by shooting a student while teaching them how to not get shot by an active shooter. I mean, this country is is just a, a joke when I think yeah. about it in retrospect, but. I uh, yeah, I mean, the, they're saying they have to do this investigative investigation on their part. That makes sense uh, as far as liability goes. But at the end of the day, anyone with eyes and anyone who's heard the story knows that he did it and knows that he should be fired, if not, you know, gone to jail. Which I think that there should, you know, the family should pursue civil penalties if they're able to, um, or you know, there should be criminal penalties uh, yeah. put in place because. You, it's just wrong. I mean, there's no other way to put it. What he did is wrong. Yeah, it's extreme, obviously. I'm glad, I'm very happy no child was actually killed or hurt more seriously. We have more on the other side is indisputable stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We have a lot of show left. Let me read some of these amazing comments. We got a lot of comments. Appreciate you in advance. Obviously, I cannot read all of them. I'll read as many as I can. Um, don't forget, uh, Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi, we are less than $5,000 away from hitting our goal of 28,000. We are so close because of you. I thank you for being such a participant and making sure our brothers and sisters in Jackson, Mississippi have clean water and can test the water as it becomes repressurized. You can help make a contribution, $25, $10, $5. National Clean Water Collective today. Make the donation at tyt.com forward slash relief. Thank you again in advance. All right, we got a lot of comments. Um, Tall Glass of Shut Up Juice says, what exactly is being done to them? That guy seems to have a decent home and he has the freedom to broadcast his hatred across the internet. How is he oppressed? How is he a victim? Uh, and remember, Fuentes, held his white nationalist rally down in Florida. And guess who was one of the keynote speakers? Marjorie Taylor Greene, an actual white nationalist rally. She claimed she wasn't aware of what kind of rally it was. She, she was invited to speak as she spoke. Um, all right, Biden Flavor Corn Pop says, why would anyone accept someone asking them to take a demotion for no reason? 
looks like a fair verdict. Very important court decision here. Nice and visible, those millions coming to her. That's right. Now, remember, tort reform has created all of these limitations on what a person can actually get. But it does send a very clear message to corporate America. Get it together, all right? Okay, Lynn, FedEx starting the payment of reparations for systemic racism. Damn right. Damn, that's exactly what I would have said. I need all my 360 plus million, every bit of it, all right? Okay, and YouTube member, welcome to Indisputable. Thank you so much, Straw Hat Dragon uh, and Twitch. Uh, Min, Mandy2341 says, where are my responsible gun on the folks? Exactly, got something for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish a Karen would. You wanna call the police on them for having a barbecue on a In Sunday? I finally ran into a Karen. I got my kid in the car. Go ahead. If you want to make a long suit, go ahead. You, you just hit that car. Let me get through You just hit that car. I'll go inside. You hit her car. I'll go inside. Look at this. I'll go back up and I'll go inside. What you saying? Hey. You just, you just hit her car. Right now. No, I didn't. You just hit her car, it's on camera. It's just the line. No, no, I'm going to go Okay, but it's not that serious, it's just the line. If you want, I know, but you need to go behind me, just hit my bumper. Go, hey, get, let me see. It's on camera. No, I'm not going to go right away. What would you do for a DQ uh, blizzard? You just hit this lady. That's a whole lot. Hey, call the police so she can so she can get her. Uh... I'm not. The YouTube putting your information right here. Yeah. Oh, you're leaving? Get a license plate. Get a license plate. Get her license plate. You see, I almost felt bad for OG Karen until she tried to drive away from the scene of the accident. This is now a hit and run. So when OG Karen was saying things like, I didn't hit anything, that was game. She was running game, okay? OG Karen, come on now. Privilege, ladies and gentlemen. It was a fender bender, a bumper to bumper thing, right? Hey, I apologize. Exchange information. Doesn't seem to be any serious damage, but if it is, I'll contact my insurance company. Whatever you gotta do. It's real simple, it's not complex here. All right, um, attorney, what are your thoughts here? I mean, this is when she leaves, that's a crime for real. It's a real crime. Yeah, I will say the second that I watched, or the first time I watched this video, I felt the fear of God in my heart because that woman looks exactly like my great aunt Linda. Aww. And I was like, please, Lord, don't let it be her. <laughs> don't let it be her. <laughs> but it, it's not. So, uh, so Aunt Thanks. Linda's clear. Um, I mean, yeah. At first, when I when I was first watching it, I was thinking, uh, oh, I mean, Karens are so bold. Of course, she'll just say, oh, I didn't hit you, knowing well that she hit her. But then now I'm realizing uh, as the video progresses, okay, so she's trying to create deniability because she knows she's being recorded. Um, I mean, of course, he was going to get out of the car and record that she did, in fact, hit that vehicle. Um, but I mean, it is really bold, a bold move to just drive away when you know that you've got at least one person recording you. You know that they've had ample time to write down your license plate number. And you know that he said he's going to call the police, so they might even be on their way already. Um, so, you know, it is just, you know, an example of the of the boldness with which Karens will engage with society. Yeah, and here's the thing. The fender bender, you're not in any real trouble unless you have like a warrant out for your arrest or something. You're not in any trouble. It's a ticket at worst, all right? At possibly not even resulting in a ticket if the two people can work it out. You're on private property. Oh well. An ex cop, an ex cop preyed on a 15 year old child while he was a cop. Let's put up his picture full mass here. A former New Orleans police officer who had a history of behavioral complaints pleaded guilty to assaulting a 15 year old crime victim. I'm gonna give you background on Rodney Vicknair. Rodney was a cop dispatched to help a 14 year old victim of sexual assault. After months of grooming this victim, 
He would then go on to sexually assault said victim himself. After complaints were made to two agencies, Officer Vicknair was arrested and charged with sexual battery, indecent behavior with a juvenile, and malfeasance in office. Vicknair is scheduled to be sentenced in March. Let me give you background to this. Vicknair, who is a 13 year police veteran, a 13 year veteran of the New Orleans Police Department, was dispatched to a girl's home to drive her, accompanied by her mother, to a children's hospital in New Orleans. This was for a forensic medical examination. In the waiting room, Officer Vignair showed the girl photos of another girl posing in bikinis and lingerie, who he said was his 16 year old daughter. The grooming process for his own sexual perversion started while the child was getting an examination from the sexual assault. There's more. After the hospital visit, Officer Vicknair remained near constant presence in the girl's life. The lawsuit claims that from June through September 2022, he called the girl almost every day, frequently visited her at home, asked that she meet him outside in his car under the pretense of acting as her mentor. During those four months, he bragged about committing acts of violence, joked about how he could kill her loved ones, and repeatedly described sexual acts he would like to engage in with the child. Officer Vicknair solicited sexual acts, which she declined, and asked her to send him nude photos, which he displayed as the lock screen of his cell phone. The lawsuit says, twice he exposed his genitals to her over FaceTime. It says, the lawsuit says he groped her multiple times, including once when he entered her home at night and shined a flashlight in her face to wake her up. On two occasions, he used his fingers to sexually assault her while in his police vehicle. Once its doors were locked, the lawsuit says, both times he was armed with his gun. Let me give you background to the misconduct that already existed before these complaints were alleged against this dirty ass cop. Vignair was a bad choice to send to assist a child victim of rape because he was not a member of the police department special victims unit or child abuse unit, a requirement under New Orleans police department policy. They created the policy, they decided to violate it. And he also had a history of complaints involving allegations of unprofessional and even illegal conduct, some of which included predatory behavior toward women. Now, what did the department do? Nothing, not a damn thing. They allowed him to remain an officer, put him in front of individuals that he posed a danger and threat to, and had no issue with it whatsoever. Violated their own policies to put someone like him in positions like that to victimize children in their own community. That's what the cops did, the police did that, all right? Protect and serve my ass. In one case, he used police equipment to use a woman's license plate to obtain personal information and called her name in a grocery store parking lot. He received five days of suspension and a letter of reprimand for this offense. A year after the letter of reprimand was issued, the lawsuit says, Vignair was promoted to a mentor position for new recruits. Put up the superintendent, the chief and superintendent. Sean Ferguson has held this position since 2019. Now let me say this, okay? If a police department is not concerned with the health and the well being of a child in their community, that police department is corrupt to its core. Corrupt to its core. Now, you could talk about how there are more good cops than bad cops, fine. You believe that, you believe that. But damn it, how in the hell does this guy have so many complaints on record? On record. 
getting positions of authority, positions of mentorship to children. And he's literally sexually harassing women in that local community utilizing police equipment to do so. And you give him positions of even more trust. What does he have on you, chief? What does he have on you, captain, sergeant, whoever in the hell signed off on this? What does he have on y'all? That's a relevant question. And until you answer that question or show me clearly that there's a distinction between you and this piece of you know what, you will be clumped into the same narrative and rightfully so. All right, just sister thoughts here. I think a lot of people have a misconception about what the nature of a sexual crime is like uh, rape or sexual assault and that it's a crime of someone who wants to have sex with someone who doesn't want to have sex with them. But in reality, it is a violent crime of exerting your will on somebody. It is not like a crime of sexuality, it is a crime of power. So we see that here. With all of the compiling circumstances of his actions, he's sexually assaulting her while he's in his police car, a symbol of power, which you know undermines her ability to you know verbalize consent. It undermines her ability to get out of the situation. You know, forget the fact that he's already a police officer; is always going to be in a position of power. Yep. He's an adult; she's a minor; is always going to be in a position of power. But you know, he's wearing his gun when he's doing it. It's it's about exerting his will over someone who he has taken control away from. And that kind of action is accepted and encouraged in law enforcement and these corrupt law enforcement and these corrupt police departments, which is why we see him not just be able to get away with this essentially with impunity, but to get promoted. And he can he could be suspended for five days, but then come back and get promoted into a mentorship position. Where he is directly engaging with, you know, inferior officers who might be women, despite him being a sexual harasser, a known sexual harasser. Where he has a position in the community, where he is engaging directly with people who could be vulnerable. So it's it's really just symbolic, more so of the deep dis, the the deep issues within law enforcement in this country. Yeah, very sad. Well said. Unfortunately, we will be reporting on something like this again in the future. We got more on the other side, it's indisputable, stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We have a lot of show left, let me read some of these amazing comments. Got a lot of them, not a whole lot of time. All right, Mickey C, the silver hair dragon says, that Karen didn't do herself any favors with those leggings with the target on each cheek. <laughs> That's so wrong, all right. Travenos Dragon, I'm not reading that, okay? Not gonna do it, I'm funny though. Dark Angel 3, thank you for this. Follow up on the Nordstrom Kevin, just spoke to manager Elizabeth Gray, profuse apologies about how it was handled, but no info on employee status. Well, thank you for that follow up. A Martin, thank you A Martin. Uh, school shooting is crazy in 20 different ways. Was he training them to load and unload guns? I didn't know children could bring guns to school. Mina the Singing Dragon, all right, thank you. Hey, Rayvon and Dr. Richie, when I work in 911, cops somehow always fell upward. One of our sergeants went viral harassing a black girl and then got demoted to detective. Happens all too often, doesn't it? All right, and um, let's go to Mandy2341. The fact that people have these um, histories and still continue to hold jobs is absolutely sounding like it's the culture, uh, that's correct. All right, um, Hyundai, okay, let's go ahead and just put it up full mass, all right, and all of his glory. This is wow, a manager, according to the narrative, forces workers at Hyundai to call him master. Black workers have to call him master. Five assembly workers of the Hyundai Motor Manufacturing Alabama plant in Montgomery have filed a lawsuit alleging a culture of racial discrimination and retaliation. Let's put up the attorneys, Arthur Davis is one, and Ivy Best, left and right, okay? They are representing Frederick Coleman, Edward Daniels, Jason Ingram, Stacy Trumbull, and Jimmy Williams. All are black male employees. Once again, according to the suit, the manager at this 
facility makes black people call him master. Their lawsuit says that despite making up 85% of the workforce on the assembly lines at Hyundai Motor Manufacturing Alabama, qualified black candidates are denied promotions and workers who complain about discrimination are punished with bogus write-ups and told their jobs are now in jeopardy. They allege that there is blatant racism on the assembly plant floor, including one instance where a group of black employees were told to call that manager master. Attorney says, and I quote, these men, four of whom still work at Hyundai, are risking good paying jobs by standing up for their rights. They are frustrated, but they refuse to work on a plantation and no one is their master. Additionally, last month, former HMMA Director of Administration, Yvette Gilkey Shuford, sued the company for racial and gender discrimination. Scott Posey, let's put him up, the public relations manager for the plant, did not speak directly to the case, but disputed there being a discriminatory culture at the facility. Now I gotta say this, if if there's a manager making black employees call him master, now obviously that speaks to a discriminatory culture at the workplace. Now I understand your job here, Scott, your PR person, your job is spin, that's what you do for a living. You take truth and you manipulate it for the masses to digest it better for the sake of the company you represent. But when you decide to engage in a statement that lacks the very humanity required in a, in a situation like this, you're not doing your company any favors at all. Listen, discrimination permeates in environments all across the planet. To suggest that somehow your company is completely immune from it, well, that doesn't make much sense. Everybody has a blind spot and also bad actors are present all over the place. The reality is, if you would have said something that at least stood up for those workers who have been loyal to you, loyal to that company. You stood up and made a statement affirming your support of them and their advocacy and their truth. This would have gone over a lot better, but you did not. You chose the normative route of corporate domination and yes, frankly, white privilege. Okay, thoughts here. It is of course that individual's job to and the company, you know, his his work is on behalf of the company. That's his position there, that's his role. So he has to paint them in a good light. That doesn't change the fact that it's a shameless act, that you know what's going on at that company. You know the racism, the discrimination that's happening throughout the company, the level to which it's occurring and to still choose to make that statement. I mean, if I was in that role, I would quit my job, but you know, <laughs> yeah, he had a choice. He made that, I think, the wrong choice. But I do want to touch a little bit on what the attorney for the worker said. Which was that the um, that there's still people working for Hyundai and that they're very brave to do what they're doing and that they're risking you know not getting higher paying jobs by by putting themselves in this position, which is exactly true. Um, other companies don't want to hire a candidate that they think is going to sue them, you know. So so they're definitely risking better job opportunities in the future to stand up for what's right. And it is an act of bravery to continue to to go and be on the assembly line every single day, uh, knowing that you are going to be targeted worse that you're under a microscope and they're gonna look for any opportunity to fire you and get you out of this company. But what they're doing, you know, they're, they're doing the right thing and they're paving a good path for workers that will come after them. And it'll be, a, you know, if they get a good judgment on this, it'll be a good signal to other car manufacturers that they're under a microscope because this is not, Hyundai is not the only car manufacturer that's being sued right now for racial discrimination, yeah. Tesla as well. So, you know, I hope that a good judgment in this case is gonna, help change practices, not just at Hyundai, but broadly, more broadly within the industry. Well said, all right. Come on. I, I take fighting classes, bitch. USC. Come at me. We all do MMA. 
Why are you fat then? Thugs, savages. Now here's the thing, all right? I do not condone violence, but that was self-defense. She ran up there, she messed around, she found out. Now, the attack was unwarranted, was not necessary. Nobody was trying to do anything with her. But I did find it interesting after the combat, after the physical combat, when the young lady who had to defend herself said, she made the comment that she takes fighting classes. I was done. I gotta tell you, I've seen a lot of fights in my life. I'm from Glenwood Road, Decatur, Georgia. I have never seen, heard, witnessed at the end of a fight, somebody yell, I take fighting classes. That's a new one, all right? Like your style there. Jordan, thoughts here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, you just. If you, I just do you take fighting classes, Jordan? What's that? Do you take fighting classes? Uh, no, but I for years I, I I have hit a heavy bag at the gym, which is that kind of counts. Yeah. But uh, I'm not walking up to people, you know, trying to throw haymakers because you just never know who <laughs> what that's right to find out. That's right. <laughs> Let's put these pictures up. I thought it was an interesting story here in that picture. Uh, one, two, three. You know, as I said before, uh, good form. She's keeping her hands up. Yeah, That's good. Yeah, all right. There's a video of post accident conversation and what the police decided not to do. Here's part of it. You guys okay? Uh, I'm a little okay. I had my baby with me and everything, but uh, yeah. she, hit, she hit me pretty hard though, like a thump. Baby in the car seat? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, all right. I don't know. She uh, her uh, she looks kind of like slurring. What is she? She's just been working a lot lately. A lot of overtime hours and real sleepy. So yeah. she goes off, is what you saying? Do what? You saying she goes off? Yeah. Are you guys doing any tests on her just in case? So she has no nystagmus. Uh, she's slurring. She has zero nystagmus, which means it's the first clue. Isn't she slurring though? Yes. Say again. Isn't she's she slurring? Uh, she has a she has a medical condition. But we don't her, know that. Uh, her lip is kind of uh, lagging, I guess you'd say. Can we have? I a, did ask. Excuse me, her. Um, Mr. Thompson. Say it again. Can you get a supervisor? You can call a supervisor, okay. man. I mean, that's fine. Can you do that? I mean, well, I don't know what a supervisor is going to do. We don't know what her medical condition is. We're not her doctor, so we don't know why she's slurring. We don't know. I got more video, but let me explain what's happening now. Uh, a woman hit them. You have people in the car, including a child, a very young child. Well, they noticed that the woman was incoherent, slurring seemed intoxicated or on something else. Police come, they seem really friendly with someone else at the scene who's connected to the person who caused the accident. And they start to get suspicious. There's more video, here it is. We're not medical professionals, so we don't know that. We're not. So the only best thing to do is to check in to make I'm sure. And that's protocol, that's protocol. So I don't understand why you wouldn't check it. You're sitting here and you're telling us what our medical the, the, the condition is, but you don't know that. as well, man. I understand the medics checked well, her, so. but the medics did not do a, a breathalyzer on it. That's your job. Right, I don't smell any alcohol. Or but she still could be under yeah. fentanyl or she could be taking something else. So why haven't you checked? What's your concern? She's slurring. She has five coming to tell us that she's really tired, she's been overtime working. Well, how do we not know How do we not know that there's more than that going on? So he wants to come over here and tell me that she has a medical condition with her lip. He's not a medical professional, so how does he know? So I'm saying to the both of you, if she's slurring, and she's, we got video of her slurring, why not do the, take the extra step and check? Okay. You're saying to me, it does, I don't smell any alcohol. What if it's something else? What if she's under the, the, the medication? So why are you guys not taking that step and checking? Give me a second, okay? Okay. Once I walked up with my partner right there speaking with her, yes. I kind of stood to the side. Yes, I, I understand. Did, I did watch her, okay? Yep. And I saw her speaking oh, okay. with her. Oh, I did. Okay. And you didn't notice her slurring? We have it on I, video. I, she I, was. On the slurring part, no. Not not from that little, you know, the little interaction. That I was right there. Right. Okay? I, I didn't see that. Um, but we'll go back up there and, and see if she's slurring now. Okay? I appreciate that. Okay. okay. 
This is in Hoover, Alabama. These are Hoover police officers. And there's more. Here it is. Hi, right, man. Uh, this is a uh, case card. This is the case number. I'm Officer Thompson. That's my badge number. Um, you're going to be Unit 2, which means you know, you're not at fault. It, my sergeant said if you want to talk to him, you can go to the operations center because right now we're hindering traffic flow. We're getting that that vehicle loaded up. Medics cleared her, says she was fine. She has a burst defect. She's got all the indications. That's why her speech may seem slurred to you. She seems fine to myself and the other officer and the medics as well. So if you want to talk to our supervisor, he'll be at 3142 Lorna Road. You guys can talk to him there. Well, I, right? I would do that. All right, the wife uploaded this to Reddit. We just got a lot of questions trying to get to the bottom of it. Let me give you some more significant background. So details of the incident per potential um, Lime's comments, that's the poster. Cops and dad admit the driver who ran into the back of my non-moving car fell asleep, which caused the accident. My husband called the police because she was incoherent after the accident. He asked her for insurance, ID and registration before he decided to call the police. And she was slurring and out of it. She could not process a sentence. Her words were jumbled. She also tried to give him her credit card as her ID. So he called the police and told them that she was obviously impaired. Basically everyone agreed the driver fell asleep behind the wheel, just not as to why, okay? Uh, the police report is a joke. Uh, she says, it simply states cause of accident drowsiness. None of her admissions, nothing about the scene, nada. Not even who was drowsy was on the report, which left an interpretation to suggest the person who got hit was the one drowsy. There's more details on the dad of the person driving and caused the accident. Dad came to the car, all right? So dad comes to the car to tell us what happened in the accident initially, not the police, not the police. So this civilian guy explained there was no need for a sobriety test. So I kind of suspected he was a cop at that point. He had a cop haircut and the way they were deferring to him was the next clue. I asked them at the scene. If he was a Leo, and they would not answer me on that question. So clue there. Then once I got the report, I Googled his name and there he was all over the net, retired deputy in the town over. I knew it then, a potential Lime's husband was actually hurt due to, to the accident. A paramedics did nothing according to their narrative. My husband had back pain and whiplash after this, and they barely asked him two questions beyond if I could take him to the ER myself. They also did not even check my son out. I had to take them both to the ER after the accident. So I just wanted to share that my son is fine. His car seat was perfect, Hubs is still in pain. Potential Lime explained this happened in Hoover, Alabama with Hoover officers. So here is the department's chief, Nicholas Dursis, all right? Interesting stuff here. Now, obviously a lot of speculation, but she did go back and research the name. She saw the signs, her and her husband. And no, none of this is normative protocol. Look at all those excuses. I mean, everybody came to the Door with the same excuse. Oh no, 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 it's a medical condition. Listen, absolutely not. Nothing else is going on here. Everyone had the same story because they had the same huddle. Understand this, they had the same story because they had the same huddle. The only person who wasn't privy to the story was the brother who just pulled up. He didn't know what the hell was going on. But you can see in his face, when she explained to him what happened, he obviously knew this don't add up. All right, this is the thoughts here. I I love that she was engaged in what me and my friends jokingly call cop phrenology, uh, assigned mm. cop at birth, if you will. You can look at <laughs> the redness of their face, their haircut, shape of their head, and just know that 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 guy is a cop. Yeah. Um,
Um, I will say as a person with a disability that causes me to suddenly lose consciousness, um, I'm sympathetic to the idea that someone who ha has the plight of a disabled person doesn't necessarily want to be interpreted as being drunk because that happens to me. I have uh, excessive daytime sleepiness. People often, even sometimes while I'm you know, doing the show, people will message in and say, "Oh, I know you've been smoking or a little bit, right? But like, I'm just, I'm just disabled. So you know, on that front, I, I can understand you know, why people might be concerned. But I think the fact that her dad was a cop, the fact that she tried to hand her credit card over as an ID is is really evidence of the fact that it's not disability related and alcohol or, or drug related. Um, and more than that, the disabled people do drink and do drugs too. So even if she did have a, a disability, that wouldn't preclude the cops from taking a breathalyzer test. I mean, for the love of God, the courts have held that cops can forcibly take your blood at a hospital with yeah. a warrant to check it for alcohol if you deny a breathalyzer test. So there's no reason that they couldn't just also do with the evidence that they were presented of her being intoxicated, a breathalyzer test. But they're continuously refusing to do it while simultaneously oversharing information about this woman's supposed medical condition, which they were not at liberty to tell the other drivers in the other vehicle about. I think it all really comes together to show that this, there's something more going on here, something a, a little corrupt, some sort of cover up, whatever it may be for drugs, alcohol, I don't know. But there's definitely more to the story. Yeah, all right, we got more on the other side is indisputable stick and stay. All right, welcome back, always good to be with you. We have a lot of comments, only have a few minutes. Lynn says that's correct, not a Hyundai plant, but rather a plantation. Um, Kai might be a dragon, thank you for this Kai. Uh, Title IX can assure that Hyundai loses any US federal subsidies it may have for this if pushed. That's correct, you're absolutely right. Uh, because those funds require that you have a racial, racially, uh, that you have a discriminatory free zone, all right? That's what it requires. Uh, C. Michael Henson, uh, thank you C. Michael. The incoherent driver must have had a white privilege card, meaning my dad was a cop card. Yeah. All right. HBCU volleyball team, historically black college and university. Well, this team decided to quit an entire tournament because of racism, all right? Um, let's put it up full mass here. Proud of these students for standing up for what is right. Still, I got questions. The Talladega College, which is an HBCU, I'm a professor at an HBCU myself. Their women's volleyball team withdrew from their conference, their conference tournament in Alabama after a member of the team was subjected to racial abuse during an awards banquet, according to the officials. Let me give you background to the incident. Um, a Talladega College player using a feature that allows nearby cell phones to transfer data to each other, received a racially motivated picture during the Southern States Athletic Conference's volleyball awards banquet. This was held last week during the tournament in Montgomery. The conference said in a statement, officials did not release details on what the image showed. But the conference described the act as vile and vicious. It's just a very unfortunate thing. We wish it hadn't happened, Commissioner Mike Hall said in an interview on Wednesday. The team left the banquet and quit the tournament. The college said in a statement issued in support of the players actions. And I stand with these players, I'm thankful they already know. There are things in life more important than winning a game. Beautiful way to stand up for your fellow teammate and stand up for society at that. Let's put up the president of this institution, Dr. Gregory J. Vincent, whom I heard is a remarkable president, an award winning educator, executive, acclaimed civil rights attorney and community leader who serves as the 21st president of the college. He issued a statement. He said, and I quote, we commend, we commend the women's volleyball team. We celebrate them for their bravery. We honor them for their commitment to the founding principles of Talladega College, as well as the tenets of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the school said. College President Gregory J. Vincent has since talked with the team. The statement said, and Hall said the 11 school conference was still investigating what happened a week ago. Later, the league they were in, the conference league, also issued a statement. And the reason part, the SSAC 
will not condone this type of behavior. We're very supportive of all of our student athletes, coaches and staff from our 11 institutions. We sincerely regret that this occurrence happened, the league statement said. Uh, let me give you background to the college itself. This is a college with a proud tradition. Uh, Talladega College located about 55 miles east of Birmingham was formed by freed enslaved black people after the Civil War ended in 1865. The conference is comprised of small schools from Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Now, once again, very proud of these great leaders who did exactly what they did. I'm happy the president is standing with you, full throttle, 100%, no question. But for some reason, the league is not releasing what happened. They are not saying what went down. The conference leadership, they have decided to hide this. So I'm talking directly to the students, it's up to you. If if you don't like the fact they're hiding it, if you think it needs to be on the record, send me an email, I got you. Indisputable at TYT, just send me the email, I make sure it happens, okay? Now, if you don't want it to be out, if this was a collective decision, I respect that too. Don't send me an email. But if you do want it to be out and the powers that be have forced it into a hiding place, I will expose it. All right, this is what are your thoughts? Yeah, first I want to say, um, as long as the players uh, from the college are, are want, willing to have that information released, you know, it's really difficult for there to be accountability without also transparency. So it is a little suspicious that the league has been withholding this sort of information from the public, while also, you know, acknowledging that there was a situation generally. Um, also, say it's really commendable of the school of the of volleyball players to, you know, re refuse to participate in a racist conference where their players are not being valued because there's a lot of pressure, uh, especially within sports when these sort of things happen to just sort of, you know, grin and bear it for the sake of the game, for the sake of, of, of winning. And to see the, you know, a college that values its athletes more than it values its trophies is yeah. very commendable. So, you know, solidarity with the athletes and, and good, good on behalf of the college for, for yeah. standing behind them too. Well said, always a pleasure having you on the program. Tell people how they can follow you, check out your great work. Absolutely, you can see my videos on Rebel HQ on um, on Facebook and on YouTube. You can follow me on Twitter until Elon Musk drives that into the ground. At Ray Bona TTV, and you can see my show reactions every Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on uh, TYT's Twitch channel. Thanks Thank for having so me on, much. Dr. Richie. Always a pleasure. All right, we got more on the other side. The bullpen is next. Stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We have a lot of show left. Let me read just one or two comments, okay? Press for time. Lynn says, I hate what happened to that uh, Talladega volleyball team, but I love that photo of the team, pure joy. That's right, some things are more important than winning a game, all right? Standing up for others, seeking out connection through humanity, all right? More important than winning a game. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. We have a fascinating civil rights attorney and advocate on the show today. Before I go to him, we got something for you, here it is. This is a case where plainclothes police officers snuck into my client's house through a window, searched his house without a warrant or other legal justification, found nothing and left, but they got caught on hidden surveillance cameras. I'm just gonna watch you go out to make sure everything's good, okay? Mm -hmm. On October 25th, 2022, she filed a federal section 1983 lawsuit against the city of Fayetteville, the chief of police, Officer Haddock, and Detective Amanda Bell. There are three primary civil rights violations here under federal law, unreasonable search and seizure under the Fourth Amendment, for the initial seizure and then the prolonged detention, excessive force under the Fourth Amendment for the manner in which Ms. Dunlap was taken into custody, as well as First Amendment retaliation for the officer's response to Ms. Dunlap filming them. Is there a First Amendment right to call a police officer a tyrant? Yes. Does it matter whether he's actually a tyrant or not? No. Does it matter whether you're a pastor standing out in front of your church or a homeless guy with a cardboard sign? No. But we all know that law enforcement has difficulty with accurately identifying the real reasons that they do things. All right, on the show today, we have John H. Bryan, civil rights attorney, constitutional activist, blogger, and YouTuber. We appreciate his videos, have covered multiple cases that he has covered as well. 
Uh, Attorney Good Day, welcome. Great to be here, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here, man. When you were breaking down the, the video just now, I was reminded of civil procedure. So I'm currently in law school and learning about the dynamics of constitutionality as it relates to policing in America is quite fascinating. The police violate it all the time. Uh, what made you get into this line of lawyering in the first place? Well, probably my origin story goes back to I grew up in Florida. Some of my earliest memories having to do with law enforcement were observing my father get pulled, getting pulled over by the police. And my, my father was a, is a great guy and he, he was an orthopedic surgeon, very well respected in the community. But it was a stark contrast to see what the way he was treated by law enforcement. And I, I grew up in that environment that when I started driving, I personally experienced being harassed by the police. Um, then went to college, I had a friend of mine get a DUI, even though we had been returned, we had returned from the library. I knew he hadn't been drinking, he blew a 0.00 once he was already incarcerated. So that sort of built it up inside me, this sort of like, yeah, one day, I want to be a lawyer and I, I want to sue the police and or I want to do whatever. And then came the opportunity to apply for a job at the Department of Justice. And I sort of told them that story in my interview. And then one day they called me and they're like, hey, John, how would you like to come investigate police officers? And I was like, I would I would like to do that. And so that was that was how I first got into it. And then when I went out and practice in West Virginia, I just sort of, I knew I wanted to do work like that. I didn't think it would be available, but I was wrong. So you always get crazy phone calls as a lawyer, but I started really taking those those calls and investigating those cases from day one in my practice. And also practicing criminal defense at the same time, and they overlap a lot. So yeah. to make a long story short, that's how I ended up kind of where I am now. Attorney Brown, let me pose something to you because I find it to be quite ironic. We cover a lot of police misconduct on Indisputable. Some of those, many of those stories are exclusive. So we get the video in advance, nobody else has it. We review it and then we provide the context for it. What I've seen and it's really connected to law enforcement like no other industry. Individuals who are practitioners inside of law enforcement. They tend to break the law intentionally so, many of them. When they break the law, they're doing it with the knowledge that they are breaking the law or violating the rights of a citizen. Compare that to other professions. If you are a medical doctor and you intentionally break the law, you don't see that kind of, the connection doesn't exist in other professions like it does in law enforcement. I don't understand why somebody would go into law enforcement and not like law enforcement or not like the element of enforcing the law. Keep this in mind, brother. If somebody tells the cop what the law is, and if they're right, the lawyer gets, I mean, the uh, cop gets mad. They, they're not happy you know the law. If you tell your medical doctor something that you know about, uh, that's a medical fact. Most of the time, the doctor is happy that you know something about a medical fact, right? But not the police. Why do you think there's such a difference in the industry of policing? Well, cops seem to be antithetical to the notion of law. Well. I think it's just a product of them being in an environment with absolutely zero accountability. Mm. Unlike doctors who are compelled to be responsible for their mistakes, police officers live in an environment where there's no accountability whatsoever because they have qualified immunity. And and it, that's like doctors, um, you know, having some defense mechanism where, yeah, they. They accidentally cut off the wrong arm, but it was kind of, they meant well, it was a good faith sort of mistake. So there's no liability there. So the person's just out of luck. I mean, that's absurd for every other profession, right? every other line of work, every other industry. Yet it exists in law enforcement. And that's such an important one that impacts us you know, around the country. And there's no accountability. I mean, that is 95% of the problem that we have in law enforcement today, in my opinion, is the existence of qualified immunity and 
a complete lack of accountability. During the previous presidential campaign, every Democrat ran on the platform of police reform. Um, and even some Republicans echoed sentiments of police reform. As a matter of fact, 96% of Americans believe that police reform is necessary on some level. I'm not talking about uh, justice reform, we're talking about police reform. All right, 96% of, of, of Americans say we gotta do something about it. The reality is not much is being done. Where do you think this fell off the track? Where do we go wrong? How did this happen? How did this become normative in American culture? Well, I call this the Bermuda Triangle of politics because honestly, the, the left and the right should find some common ground here because they just don't realize that they should agree on this issue. And you ask, where did we go wrong? I'll tell you exactly where we went wrong shortly after the Civil War. You know, when the founding fathers created this country, there was no such thing as Thomas Jefferson getting pulled over in his carriage on the way to, to Philadelphia. It wasn't a thing. It wasn't a thing that the possession of any object, including a plant, could be illegal in our country at the founding of our country. Possession, uh, possession laws were not a thing. Where did that start after the Civil War? Everything changed after the Civil War. I think our first possession law came about in the 1870s. And if I recall correctly, the first drug possession law was from California and it was meant to harm the Chinese population there because they had these opium dens. So that was like the first drug possession law was really um, just uh, to attack the, the Chinese population. But it just got worse and worse and worse. Um, because old people vote and old people like to feel safe and politicians like to get the votes of, of those individuals. So it compounded. So whereas in 1791, we had like 20 federal crimes, you know, treason, murder, just you know the obvious. Fast forward to now, we have 5,000 plus federal crimes, okay? And several thousand more in every state. I mean, we are, we have over criminalized our country. We have over criminalized and that is, that's a political topic that should be common ground for both the right and the left because it's, it's the government who's benefiting from that. It's the politicians who are benefiting from that. And it's, it's the people on both ends of the spectrum politically who suffer. Let's talk about qualified immunity. I agree with you 100%. It's a ridiculous notion, needs to be eliminated. Uh, the George Floyd Policing and Accountability Act in its original version would have chipped away at this qualified immunity dynamic. Some states have passed laws to lessen the barrier or lower it, uh, but it is still present. That kind of immunity, as you suggest, has created a culture that allows for no accountability. Uh, and in that kind of culture, you're able to do things in the extreme and not be held accountable for doing so. And I'm reminded of the instances, attorney, when a cop shoots an unarmed person in the back and that cop says, "Oh, I thought I was shooting my taser, right? We've seen those cases. And I remember debating someone on this issue and getting beyond the training that's required, the fact that it's a different weight, it's a different color. It has a different trigger grip. It's on the different side of your body, all right? All of these differences. At the end of the day, do we have any instances where a cop made the mistake the other way? Meaning they meant to grab their gun, but instead they grabbed their taser. And because of that, the person is alive. No, we don't have one of those instances on the record. And so I can only conclude that one or two things are happening here. Either number one, some of these cops lying about what actually happened. Or number two, they have such indifference about the life in front of them. They don't really care or instinctively think they should grab a gun and kill them. What has your practice seen as it relates to police violence, especially against unarmed people of color? Well, I do practice in West Virginia. So the majority of, of, of incidents I deal with um, involve white people. But now, not not all of them, and, and especially in one area of the state, I've I've had quite a few, and and, and recently, 
I've had a quite quite a few that I believe that there are racial components to it. But I don't I don't believe that the racial component to any of this, and my experience in West Virginia that has taught me this, it's that law enforcement, while there may be there may be um, um, race bias all over the country with law enforcement and elsewhere, they are equal opportunity aggressors. Police officers, they will, you know, they don't necessarily care about your skin color. The most important thing to them is that it's hammered into their head that you are a potential threat and they need to go home safely that night. And I think it's a training issue first and foremost. If, if you were to look into the law enforcement police academies, I guarantee you they scare these people to death. They show them video after video after video of these tragedies where police officers are shot at traffic stops and what. And the idea behind it is to pound it into their head that you know they could be shot and killed at, at any moment. But what they're doing is they're just creating somebody who's always on a hair trick. And they're treating every person they encounter as somebody who might try to murder them at any second. And, and that's just taking common sense out of the equation. Because as private citizens, when we carry a firearm in public, we can't just fly off the handle. We can't have the hair trigger. Yeah, we have to we have to act very carefully, and they don't have to do that. I'm going to respectfully disagree with you on one issue, and that is the issue of bias and how it permeates beyond the officer. So we've reported on many stories where naturally there was a racial component. We've we've also reported on many stories where the white individual. Received the benefit of the doubt, um, and they were not killed. As a matter of fact, they should have been, based on the actual scenario. One a white male actually stabbed a police officer. They work in a way collectively to reserve, preserve his life. And we've seen this happen even in simple traffic stops where a woman was able to use a white privilege card, and the white officer laughed about it and didn't, did not even ask for a driver's license, even though she was likely drunk based on her swerving. So we've seen these instances play out. We know racial bias exists, but I will also highlight what my dear brother out of Ithaca, New York said, the former mayor. He said, literally, it's about aggression. It's not just racism. If you find a person who has a nine on the scale of aggression, they have a nine aggression factor, they are likely to do something wrong while being a police. If a person is nine on the racist spectrum, but they are one on the aggression spectrum, they are probably not going to do something while on duty that would be questionable. So we have seen that as well. So I understand your point that it's not apples to apples all the time, but definitely racial bias plays into policing all across the country. Before you go, I appreciate your time today. Tell people how they can follow you, check out your work. Um, you can check me out on YouTube. YouTube, my channel is The Civil Rights Lawyer. Um, you can also check out my website at thecivilrightslawyer.com. All right, we appreciate the work you do. Thank you for that information you continue to provide on your YouTube channel. Thanks, thanks for having me on. Absolutely, all right, remember, take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of the planet. Remember, the truth is always indisputable. Welcome to Indisputable, I'm your host, Dr. Rashad Richard. We got a lot happening today, but what do we do on this show? We tell the truth, you know why we tell the truth? Because the truth is simply indisputable. Rashad, great to be here, congratulations on the new show. And I gotta let everybody know that Rashad and I go way back. Here's the pattern that we see in all of these Karen stories. They think they own stuff they do not own. Now, where does that come from? I don't know, maybe slavery. Maybe they think they should still own black people. This is what happens when Karens weaponize the police. When you're used to privilege, equality seems like oppression. It hits you in a certain way when someone is holding you against your will, treating you like you're a criminal and you're an innocent person. This is something that black people face no matter where they are. A stronger black economy lends itself to a stronger, greater economy. Don't think it's exclusive of you, it's inclusive of you. What's your beef with critical race theory? It adds more fuel to the fire of the racist tendencies that we already have. We have a generation of problem solvers that can remedy the problem if they are properly taught what the problem is. You know who created redlining in this country? Mm -hmm. The white liberal. I, I, don't, I don't give a damn who created it. If it's a racist policy, a racist policy, Shelly, here's what I don't know. I don't know. See, there you go filibustering, brother. You're scared of this truth, but you're gonna get it, though.